The talk hasn't started. The last talker, the last speaker of the day is Paul uh, Safranov from the University of Zurich. He broadcast about the categorical point of view on our medicine. Thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak here again. Okay, so in this talk, I'll give some point of view on clone groups, and everything will be extremely categorical, and there will be almost no authors. So uh, I'll ma mainly talk about these things called R matrices, and there will be different flavors of R matrices, so let me uh, write a table. There are four uh, main categories. The most possible one is what I will call constant R matrix. Uh, then there will be dynamic R matrices. There will be R matrices with a spectral parameter. And there will be a combination of these two, so both dynamical and with a spectral parameter. And so for, for each of these categories, I want to give some uh, categorical interpretation. If you think about the Jones polynomial or invariance of nodes, you might think about these kind of R matrices. Uh, dynamic color matrices appeared, I think, in, in the early 80s. Uh, people were looking at something like Liouville theory and Hodge theory. Um, and by studying a certain not natural algebra that appears in, in, the, in these theories, uh, people came out with these dynamic color matrices. Um, R matrices with a spectral parameter. Well, the, the most classical appearance is in something called phase models of statistical mechanics. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Berg's models of statistical mechanics. Um, so you might have heard of the six vertex model. Once in the box, of course. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, okay. And uh, the dynamical ones, they appeared in a slightly different presentation of, uh, in a slightly different form of uh, models of statistical mechanics, which are called phase models. Okay. So as you see, <coughs> like different kinds of uh, R matrices disappear in very different Right, so, so let me begin by saying what I mean by R matrices in each of these class. Uh, let me begin with constant R matrices. So let's say you have some vector space V. And you have an automorphism R. Of B tensor B. Okay, and then the Yen Baxter equation. So this element will be called an R matrix if it satisfies an equation called the Yen Baxter equation. <coughs> and it's the following equation. So I'll explain what the, the numbers mean here, so, but it's R23. R13, R12 is equal to R12, R23, sorry, R13, R13 <laughs> as automorphisms of the tensor cubed. And so, what are, the, what are these numbers? Well, I have an automorphism of V tensor V, 
and I want to extend this to an automorphism B tensor cubed. So for instance, R12 just means R in the first two components and then that ends in the last component. And R23 is identity in the first component tensor R in the last two components. And you can imagine what R12 means. Okay. So this is what's called a constant R matrix because it doesn't have any dependence on any extra parameter. Uh, the second class is um, well, we begin with something easy, which is the R matrix with the speckle parameter. So you can introduce a certain dependence in here. Okay, you still started with the vector space, uh, but now you, your uh, your automorphism depends on an extra parameter. Let me call it Z. And maybe z is some element, um, some complex number. And as a function of z, maybe it's meromorphic, but I will ignore it for now. Okay, and then the, the again, back to the equation with the spectral parameter looks like this. It's a version of this equation where you insert the spectral parameter. Um, so r23. Z2 minus Z3, R13, Z1 minus Z3, R12, Z1 minus Z2 is equal to R12, Z1 minus Z2, R13, Z1 minus Z3. R23, uh, Z2 minus Z3. So here uh, you have, again, this is going to be an automorphism of B tensor cubed. <laughs> and here are Z1, Z2, Z3 are some complex numbers. So maybe let, let me mention the interpretation of these. Um, if you take this matrix and just take um, what's your usual denote by R check. So you just take R and then post and pose it with the flip. So this is still an automorphism B squared. Well, the, then the yam equation becomes the braid equation. So then the R check satisfies the braid equation. This is how uh, it's related to invariance of, of class spaces. Okay, and uh, some meaning of this equation. Well, uh, one way this kind of R matrix appear is when you study uh, scattering of particles. So, in two dimensions. So, in something called integral models uh, in two dimensions. Um, the scattering of particles has the following uh, compatibility. You can study a scattering of three particles into three particles. And uh, integrability implies that um, this process three into three factorizes into uh, a sequence of two into two scatterings like this. And of course, th there's also another way to resolve this. Like this. Um, each particle carries a momentum, which is more or less the spectral parameter. And if you write down the conservation laws, you see that uh, the only thing that happens uh, in the scattering is that uh, they exchange the momentum. Okay. And then if you just um, look at this equation, the left hand side is equal to the right hand side, you get the Einbach equation with the spectral parameter. Okay. 
And the final class of R matrices are uh, those with the non parameter. <coughs> so here, uh, V is not just a random vector space, but it's a representation of an abelian Lie algebra. So let's say H is an abelian Lie algebra. Um, and then B is a representation of, uh, of H. So you can decompose it according to rates and to be lambda. Okay, and then the Yang Bachelor equation takes the following form. Can I write that? Um, can I write this? No, 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 that was a joke. Um, all right. So uh, now the R matrix depends on this domain parameter. So again, I'll explain the notation in a second. So it's R two three um, lambda minus H, the first component, R minus three lambda <laughs> plus H in the second component, R one two. the minus h in the third component, and this is equal to uh, the same in the reverse. So let's write it down. Okay, so what, uh, what, what are the parameters here? So lambda is again a parameter on uh, h dual. Uh, is it, do you think it's supposed to be a deeper in size than the other thing? Deeper in size? Like, like, Minus is one plus. plus. This is the uh, cut. Uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. So minus this is already the symmetrized form. And I think. <coughs> <coughs> let, let me keep it at the, this level of detail. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure you would know, but. It was just common sense. It was not a mathematical uh, suggestion, just uh, common sense. Two minus is one plus, right? Uh, no, but the other side, I think it could be the other way. But okay. Um, Let's just skip it at this level. Okay, uh, so, so what, what does uh, H1 and H2, H3 mean? Okay, so, so this is again an equation in automorphism, so V cubed. And um, H1 just means uh, the weight component um, of in the first component. So H1, let's say V1, V2, V3 equal to lambda 1, v1 over v2, over v3, if v1 um, is um, in the weight lambda. So it just extracts the weight. And that was not the same number, but it was kind of lower than the same. Ah, sorry. Uh, Okay, and then of course you can, tr uh, yeah, and one more equation that this has to satisfy is that R is an automorphism of B, has to be H of the variant. Okay. And as you can imagine, there's also the version with a dynamical parameter, so this is. The uh, lambda is called the dynamical parameter and the spectral parameter, so called z. You can just take this equation and add the dynamical parameter and have this similar kind of equation. Sorry to be deaf, but I, I, don't, I still don't understand what it means to evaluate r on h. So, so um, you tell me what h. So, so let me write r to z. 
of lambda minus h1. Uh, yeah, so sorry, and r is also a function of h2. Uh, and here it was a function on c. Right, so, so my goal will be to interpret uh, <laughs> some categorical, um, to give some categorical framework for the, each of those equations. Sorry, can I just ask? I know we kind of avoid it, but I think of the R's as inner pointers, quantum groups, and that quantum groups. What are they in the dynamical case of inner pointers? Um, so, so the examples of R will arise in UQG, for instance, in the finite quantum group. Uh, examples of these will arise, for instance, in quantum affine algebra, or something like that. And uh, these dynamical ones will also can also arise in UQG. I will give, in give an example for UG. Um, <coughs> so, so these dynamical ones can appear for ordinary quantum groups as well. You wrote Toto there, did you mean Whitaker there? Did you mean Whitaker says? Uh, I'm not sure what the term is. Maybe we can discuss it. So, so, yes, no, but, but, but one can also attach quantum groups to these, which are called dynamical quantum groups, and for them it plays exactly the same yeah. way. Yeah, let, 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 let me get to that. So let me begin with the uh, uh, with the interpretation of the constant R matrix. So let's say C is some braid manual category. And F is Monoidal functor from C to back. So here we start with a braid monoidal category, but uh, this functor f is not braid monoidal. And you can ex you can see how how it fails to be braid monoidal in the following way. So if you take two objects uh, d and w of C, well, you can compute their braiding. Going to be an isomorphism from the tensor W W uh, to W tensor B, and then I can apply the uh, monoidal function F, and this is going to split. The subscript F Y. Yeah. So the braiding. Uh, the, sorry. <laughs> I call them X and Y. Uh, the braiding on B and W. Um, So this is going to be a map from, it's going to be a nice morphism between these vector spaces. And this has, this um, this element, so now, now we have an uh, element between some vector spaces, this satisfies the equations uh, for our check. So if you post compose with the flip on, on vector spaces, this is going to satisfy the anti -circle. Usually it's done in the reverse. You start with the R matrix, you construct the braiding on C, where C is category representation of some quantum group, using the flip uh, post compose with the R matrix, but here I'm doing this in the reverse. Okay, so, so the option <coughs> here is that a categorical interpretation of a concept R matrix is a braid monoidal category uh, with the monoidal fiber functor. And maybe I want to give a quick example here. <coughs> so 
in some cases, uh, this spider functor factors to some other monoidal category. And I'll give an example of the standard quantum group. So let's say GQG is the standard group for triple quantum group. Refugees category representations of this quantum group. <coughs> okay, in particular, this is a very monoidal category. It turns out that there's a functor to a certain intermediate category. I'll just write this in the following way. So this is going to be modules over the quantized coordinate uh, algebra of the group G, equipped with the compatible action, uh, compatible co-action of the of GQG. So this is going to be an intermediate category, and then there's a further functor to vect, which is a fiber. <coughs> and each of them is one of them. The OQG is the quantization of SCS rather than the effect of Correct. So, uh, as they were saying, that OQG, uh, I think it appeared in Adrian's talk already. This is what's. Um, no, it's not the same. Oh, yes. it, it is. It is the same. It's not the same category, uh, but it's the same algebra. So this is what's called the reflection equation algebra, <laughs> uh, which is a quantization of certain Poisson structure on the group. Okay, so, so again, the flavor of the examples will be that there's going to be the category we care about. It will have an intermediate fiber function, int intermediate monoidal function to some somewhat complicated category. And then there will be some easy functor, monoidal functor on that maybe complicated category. Okay. So now, let, um, so this is probably very standard. Let me get to the line of the case. Is this category the diagonal category? No, uh, this is the. No, this is. Uh, so the analyst category will be commodals over OQG. This is not the analyst. The first one. Here. Um, well, so so you can write this category as. Let me write it like this. And then there's refugee and the refugee. So you, if you compute this category, it's going to be exactly modules of the reflection equation algebra. In the category of this, in the category of EQG commodities. But what does this function? So the fun, uh, if, if you identify it in this way, it's just uh, you embed into the first time, uh, it's projection to the first time, and then the unit in the second time. So is this right hand thing something like the quantization of G star mod G? Uh, G mod G star. G mod G star. So this is. It's a quantization of a certain space. Um, <coughs> okay, let, let me write it schematically like this. Um, it's not strictly speaking correct, but for now, let's say it's just you take the group, you act on the right by upper triangle matrices, and act on the left by lower triangle matrices. Sorry, but the uh, correct. Uh, so, so the correct way. The this is called the dressing action. Okay. But but you said that it's a monoidal functor, so it's supposed to be a monoidal category. Correct. So it should be a group. Uh, yeah, contains some group or. Um. It, it is monoidal category. Uh, ah, but tensor product is uh, convolution or something like that. What is tensor? 
the Tensorborg is a little bit difficult to describe. Uh, it uses some extra structure on this uh, algebra OQG. Maybe we'll get, I can try to explain this after. Is it the quantization for Chandra category? No, it's, uh, the higher Chandra category will appear in like one minute. Uh, so the hard chunk category would be the quantization of G mod G. Uh, here it's the dual loop. So this is super naive thing you could do. You would make that a big quantum field for having an artifact which takes it. Correct. Uh, this composite is that functor. I'm just saying that it factors through some intermediate, somewhat complicated category. That is useful. Uh, it's not useful for this example, but it's useful to um, for the purposes of the talk because all the examples will fit into the same pattern. This example is, is too easy uh, somehow, and this looks complicated. Okay, so so let me get to the ninth ones. And here I'll, I'll need an intermediate category. So basically, I'm going to have the same pattern. It will be a braid monoidal category, together with monoidal, fun uh, monoidal functor, but not to vector spaces, but some something else. Okay, so let's say G is not a very group. Uh, then there's a category <coughs> called the category of Harsh Chandra bimodules. Some monoidal category. Let me write several presentations for this. I'll just write HCG. Uh, okay, so one way to write this is you have a UG action and a compatible action of the group. So I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, this UG action just comes from the action of the group, there are two actions. Okay, so that's one way to write this as just a plain category. Uh, another useful way to say this is these are actually bimodules. So there are two UG actions. So modules of a UG tensor UG opposite. Uh, and the diagonal action of the group, or the diagonal action of the Lie algebra, is integrable. Meaning that it comes from an action of the group. Because these are prime modules, there's a natural monoidal structure. <coughs> so it seems like there are three actions there's a left, right, and diagonal, but of course the diagonal is just the difference between the left and the right action. So there are actually just two UG actions, and these are two. Uh, let me give an example of how this category looks like in the case of an abelian group. Okay, well, let's say we're looking at the higher Chandra category of some abelian uh, group, and by abelian, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mean the course. So, for each you write this, it just starts with n. Okay, well, the universal developing algebra of the Lie algebra is just the symmetric algebra. So, as a plain category, uh, this category is equivalent to uh, the following. So let me let me say lambda is the wave lattice. Of the torus, and then you can identify H representations with graded vector spaces. You can say that these are <coughs> lambda graded. <coughs> Sheaves on the dual of the Lie algebra. Uh, just because quasi-inner sheaf on the dual of the Lie algebra is the same as a module of the UG. 
uh, over u h because h is v. Okay, so this is as a plain category. But here there's an interesting monoidal structure coming from the fact that these are actually bimodules. And this is not a symmetric monoidal structure. So let me explain how this works. So let's say you have one, one of those uh, graded coherent sheaves uh, graded by the rate lattice. So I'll just write uh, these components as the sum of f lambda. And let me introduce an operation which I'll just denote by tau. So the rate lattice. Uh, well, it's a lattice inside of the dual of the Lie algebra. So using this weight lattice, I can translate elements of the dual of the Lie algebra. So I'll just write it like this. I'll tra translate the lambda component by lambda. Uh, so this is some sheaf on H dual, and I just translate it by lambda. structure which you can work out from this description is the following. So the monoidal structure in this category, I just put the right top of uh, HDH, is just the usual kind of structure of graded uh, cosmere sheaves for a twist one factor. And because you introduce this twist, uh, this is not symmetric. to um, dining for R matrices. <coughs> so suppose you have G uh, some of ray group. structure on the following pointer. So the monodal structure on you can take representations of, of the group. You can view them as representations of the um, of this forest H. Then you embed this uh, into this horizontal category. So this ladder conquer uh, the sense a representation of H to UH tensor tensor V. Okay, so so far I fixed the conquer, and then I'm, say, I'm saying I fix a monoidal structure. So this is an extra data. So that this data turns out to be equal to what's known as the dynamical twist. to explain what the dynamical twist is, but uh, what I'm going to explain is how this is related to um, dynamical matrices. So again, I have I have the same kind of procedure. I have a braided monoidal category, representation for the group, and it has a monoidal functor to, in this case, the Hirschhorn category. So let's see what we can extract if we apply it to the braided. Yeah. So this Hirschhorn category is the A category, right? This Hirschhorn category is an absolute version of the Daniels category. You, you, there's also a quantum group version of this. So that's the Daniels category. Right. Okay. So, so uh, again, let's take two representations. And uh, let me denote the composite by F. The 
image of the gradient. Well, to compute this, this is going to be an isomorphism in the harsh standard category like this uh, between uh tensor v tensor w to uh tensor w tensor v. So this gives rise. So this gives rise to, well, it's an isomorphism of UH module, so you can forget about this factor. So it gives rise to an element of HOM V tensor W into W of tensor V tensor functions on H2O. And then you, what you can check is that this actually satisfies the Ganbach string equation again, the dynamically Ganbach string equation. And it is also H invariant, yeah? Correct. <laughs> so again, the interpretation is exactly the same. I still have a great monolithic category, but now I have a fiber function not in two vector spaces, but in something more complicated. Okay, so, so let me give an example of such a dynamic R matrix and how it can naturally arise. And so surprisingly, this is an example of a dynamic R matrix, not on the quarter group, but on the classical group. Okay, so let's say G is some, standard, uh, some simple group, um, and then B is the parallel subgroup, and then H is the maximal torus. Uh, I should say this example. Going to it. Okay, then you can uh, look at the following diagram. Let's look at the adjoint quotient of the of the Lyapunov of the Borel. Well, this projects to the cogent quotient of the of the group G, and this projects to the cogent quotient. Of the torus H. So maybe you haven't seen it in quite this uh, way, this space, but let me say how you can think about this uh, quotient of uh, LD algebra over L mod B. So one way is you can identify this with. What's known as the Grothnick Springer equation, <laughs> mod G. Uh, well, if you don't know what this means, here's another identification. You can look at the cotangent bundle to G mod the unipotent subgroup of B. This this uh, this cotangent bundle ha it has a Hamiltonian action on the left by the group G, and on the right by the torus H. That's another way, and let me just write one more presentation. This is the same as taking the dual of the Lie algebra, taking Hamiltonian reduction by the unipotent subgroup, and then taking an extra portion by. Right, so, so I've written some correspondence. Uh, so why, why is this an interesting correspondence? Well, uh, the, the map on the right is actually generically an isomorphism. So if you look at um, the subset of regular weights, which means um, um, subset where, w, where the while group acts freely, Uh, 
uh, then the map on the right becomes an isomorphism. So what this gives me is actually a map, which of course you know this map, from um, a dual of this a subset. It embeds this into G dual mod G, and there's actually a map from the invariant that W invariance. Okay, so we get this map. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to quantize this uh, correspondence. On the left, uh, uh, yeah, uh, thanks. So the quantization of this correspondence is the following diagram with a compatible action of C and G. Well, the quantization of this is exactly the Hirschhauer category. <coughs> On the right, I'm going to have the Hirschhauer category for the torus. And in the middle, I'll have a bimodule for the quantization of the space. If you just look at this, it's a bit difficult to say what the quantization is, but then there are all these uh, other perspectives. So this, this category is the category of the G modules uh, of highest weight G modules. So upper n just means that the, the action of the of the new potent sum algebra is equal. So this is uh, some version of category O. Okay, and the, uh, the analogous result uh, on the classical level uh, has a version on the quantum level, except it looks a little bit uh, more interesting. So I'm just going to write the result. So if you look at this action, and you, you restrict to a certain subcategory, <coughs> that gives rise to the coolant. So if you look at the subcategory where the weights are non-integral, here we have highest weight modules, and you just look at the subcategory of modules which are non-integral. Then actually it becomes a clone to the higher stronger category. So this action uh, is given by, if you, have a, if, if you fix the weight, you have the corresponding verb module. And then the clean is dead. So the upshot of this is that now again I can invert this map and I get the monodal functor for the Hirschhauer category for B, not to the full Hirschhauer category for H, but uh, the subcategory with non equal weights. <coughs> And again, there's a monodal function for relations of G to this category. And this composite gives rise to the dynamical matrix by the theorem I mentioned.
and this is the Lancome matrix, all, not on the corner group, but on the cross group. But it, it will be the same as given by fusion operator? Yes, it's, this construction is literally a fusion operator. Uh, so this is called what's called standard Lancome matrix. And then there's this completely parallel story where you replace Lie algebras by Lie groups. So you look at the adjoint quotient of the group, mm -hmm. adjoint quotient of the torus, <coughs> here we have multiple tip version graph mixed re resolution, and basically you get the quantum version of this. You get what's known as standard dynamic power matrix, which is our matrix on DPG. There's a version for quantum. <coughs> And, and so what do you get? Do you get more than just this fusion operation from this construction? Right? No, the, the, this construction uh, just gives you, um, the way I presented here, it just gives you the, the monoidal structure, so the, I, I should get the fusion operators. What's interesting here is that, um, so here I said it, you, also, you also have these factors through W invariants. On the quantum level, it, it's not quite um, invariance for the wild group, but it's invariance for the break group. And the fact that it factors through those invariance, this is what's called the rank of wild group factor. So it's a little bit more more than okay. So I have 10 minutes left. Let me get to the circle case. <coughs> So what I've done here is I started with the constant case and I replaced the monoidal category backed by this more complicated Hirschhoffer category and I've obtained these that I'm called matrices. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace the notional braid the monoidal category by some other notion. But the right hand side can be either backed, which is the non dynamical case, or the Hirschhoffer category. And the idea is you use what's um, what has appeared in John's talk, uh, the notion of factorization algebra, or more precisely, factorization category. Okay, so let's say X is an algebraic curve. A factorization category on X. Categories. And we call this uh, category C. So it's a collection of sheets of categories C M on each power of the curve M X N, together with the following data. So there are three classes of maps. <laughs> so the first map is that uh, for every pairs of points on the curve which are not equal, you can take the fiber of the category on the second power of the curve at those two points, and this is just going to factorize into a tangent product. So away from diagonal on x squared, the, ca the category is already determined. It's this. And also on the diagonal, it's also determined. So if you take the same point, then you just get you're getting a single copy. <laughs> and finally, there are unit maps. Um, which are the following, so for every pair of points, there's a way to insert the trivial, um, to insert the unit, there are map uh, functors like this. And all this structure is compatible. Uh, I, I'm not going to write the whole 
way to like, call a coherent picture, but these are the main maps. Exactly, this is the alpha version. So the, the second condition implies that you actually have a sheet of categories over the run space. Does that mean this is like a crystal of categories or a crystal? Uh, no, this is a quality pure sheet. Now I'm going to consider uh, three kinds of x. I'll consider x being c, c star, or an elliptic curve. And the reason I'm considering these three classes is that x is an abelian group and it acts on itself by translations. So what I'm going to consider. Instead of braid my little category, I'm going to consider the following categorical uh, type of data. I'm going to consider a translation invariant. Factorization my little category. I'll unpack the words in a second. So what does translation variant mean? So you have an action of X on itself by translations, and it's invariant under those translations. Here I'm saying factorization monodal category. It just means that every fiber is a monodal category, not just a plain category. And all these structures are equivalences of monodal categories. And this, this function is, is a function of monodal. So let me say what I can extract out of this. So here's an observation. So this is due to causes and rules. Is that uh, this data gives rise to a spectral R matrix <coughs> in the following way. Uh, so let's take two objects, V and W, of C, uh, maybe at some point, X. Let's say we. Um, no, sorry. So let me just say that there are objects of the category C. Okay, so you can look at this object, but basically I want to run um, a kind of echon field argument. I have a monoidal structure, and I have something else which looks like a monoidal structure. So out of this, I want to combine them into something like a Brady. So I have... Um, I have an object which is B tensor 1 on the second power of the curve minus the diagonal. And I can tensor this with the object 1 tensor W. <coughs> Again, uh, on the same space. And then you can just interchange them. This is exactly like the equivalent argument. Okay, so let's So you have this isomorphism, and this isomorphism is defined away from the diagonal. But then you can restrict to the diagonal uh, up to some poles, and what you get in the diagonal is B tensor W on the left, 
and W tensor V on the right. Uh, what does it mean after some falls? The energy. The falls uh, the the don't arise on the diagonal, they arise on some shift of the diagonal. Yeah, so yes. Um, let, let me comment, comment uh, on that late, later. This is going to uh, capture formal H bar parameter. Ah, okay. where they will be on the time. Okay. So what you get is an isomorphism like this, um, which is defined. Let, let me just write it um, like this. Um, There's a uh, there's a pole at the diagonal which gives rise to this spectral parameter. So the x is a one-dimensional curve, and little x is a four-dimensional. Ah, so can I ask a good question? Uh, is it okay if I if I just get, write down the examples ah. and then ask the questions? Because I'm not out of time. So so, you're done with this, you can <coughs> come to this. Uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, <laughs> you're switching to some pickles, right? No, yeah. no, I'm going to give examples of this structure, uh, two examples, and... Uh, exactly, at this point you need to pickle, but I will do it after. <laughs> okay. I can do it, I can do it. You respect <laughs> my request, I will respect this <laughs> your, your reason. Okay, um, okay so, so there are... Actually, four examples that I want to give, but in the interest of time, I'll just give. I'll just keep them here and not write anything about them. I'll just write something cryptic here. Any beach you can ask me about these two examples. <coughs> but the example I want to talk about. It is the elliptic case. So let's say x is the, is the elliptic curve and g is PGLN. Uh, the claim is that there is a certain C uh, for, for conservation monoidal category on the elliptic curve whose fiber. Uh, is given by modules over the complete ganglion. And uh, there exists a monoidal functor, uh, which again is going to factor into two functors. So in the intermediate category, as, as I mentioned, there's something usually complicated, but in this case, something geometric. You look at the module in space of G bundles on which the curve. You look at the category <coughs> of the sheets. This category has a certain monoidal, quanti uh, monoidal deformation. So th there's a monoidal category quantizing module of G bundles on which the curve. And here, H bar is formed. And then the last functor is given by taking the fiber at a rigid G bundle with the curve. So this gives rise to rigid Akias bundles, you know, right? Uh, it's a stable Akias rigid Akias bundle, right? Uh, 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 if I understand what you mean. But yes. Spell, uh, uh, just spell. Uh, just the. Uh, so rigid principal bundle uh, means. Rigid. It has no deformations. Uh huh. Yeah, we are in the same. But yes, bundle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what is you put here, B V, uh, 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 second second name, uh, our matrix. Boxer uh, device. Right. That is, yes. Okay. So I have something to say. <laughs> I need. Uh, <laughs> it's a long story, which uh, which is some kind of interesting one. Um, uh, I think there's a whole evening for. Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to finish. Um,
with, with, with the last example, which is the dynamic uh, case which contains both the dynamical and the special parameter, and it looks exactly the same, I'm just going to change the target category. Now the group is arbitrary. Well, I have the same category. This fiber is just modules of the Yangian. Um, OK, and then it's again going to map to what you're going to choose modular bundles. And the last one is modular modular bundles for the Cartasa group. So there's an elliptic version of the category of furniture under modules modules for, for, the, for the torus, which is just modular bundles, uh, mo category of sheaves on the modular bundles. Because roughly speaking, this looks like, let's say if A is just uh, C star, this looks like B cross B C star. So sheaves on that look, look like vector space cross uh, gradient. Uh, okay. And this uh, composite gives rise to build of the land parameters. So I'm just saying. Just one minute uh, to show you something really interesting about this stuff. So it was like this. So I used this construction for first for Baxter, right? Exactly this kind of construction. Right. Sorry? Was, was it a quasi current sheaf of categories or a crystal sheaf? You mean this? this? No, that's right. Go on. Okay, we can discuss later. It's <laughs> 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 So uh, actually, I have several questions. So first of all, so we, it is known that uh, if we go sufficiently high in the categorical level, uh, then uh, all algebras become commutative. And uh, like, for example, braid the two category yeah. is commutative. So is that why uh, these R matrices are uh, square to, to the identity? So the square to the identity, uh, you, you mean the spectral ones? Yes. So the, the, the square to the identity just because this square to the identity. But is that the reason is that we are too high? Uh, no, I would, I would say it's just uh, from the geometry uh, you have, you can interchange, you can square this isomorphism twice, and because the position of the pole uh, of the points doesn't matter, you'll, you'll get exactly the unitary condition. Um, so you'll get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I was wondering if, if is the reason what uh, is it the, the same reason? That the that separated two categories are actually, actually symmetric. Or uh, you probably mean if we one category is symmetric. Yes, yes, if the algebra is yes. yes. Mm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it that way. But for example, you could start off with like the monoidal infinity category, right? Yeah, you can do this and you're still square to the other. Yes. Oh. So you can look at any part, kind of categorical level, this is still square to the end. It's just but put in you, by the geometry here. What if you were on a Sur uh, surface, it's, uh, it's still going to be the same. Uh, okay. it, so th there's no crystal in, in the picture, so that, that kind of argument will not work. Oh, okay, and then the, the, another question is, uh, so do, do you have uh, this construction? The, the radius is also twisted uh, dynamical arithmetic, which is related to, uh, let's say, <coughs> atom elliptic, uh, related to atom morphism within the entire, which was constructed by a radius of one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When was I, 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 I don't know the story, maybe you can explain this to me. Yeah, yeah, so there are the uh, people uh -huh. for usual analysis and there is a generalization for dynamical. And for all of them, there are these uh, objects. So the question is what will correspond to them? What did you, for G, P, PGLN at that moment? So PGLN arises because you want to fix a, a rigid G bundle on the rigid curve, and there's a classification of rigid G bundles. That don't exist in type A for groups of PGLN. So, th this is the standard phenomenon that in the case of elliptic quantum groups, you have R matrix uh, without the dynamical parameter only in type A, but 
with the drive of fiber, it exists in all cells. Fiber, no, not exactly. The conditions are H naught and H one Czech homology. Over the curve must be zero and zero two times. <coughs> this can be only over lifted curve. Yeah. But so this is really, the, I, for this particular it. business when you extend from the diagonal, you need only this H naught. There is a bundle, it can be about groups or about the algebras over any curve. But unfortunately, H0 and H1 together means elliptic curve no better, no worse. Yeah, so, the, the, the question was about not, not the curve, but the curve. extension from the diagonal, pole with pole on the diagonal, literally means H0 and H1 circularity, nothing else. You know, you know. Ah. And, and uh, do I understand correctly that as a corollary you get uh, uh, this uh, theorem of. Uh, uh, I would say the, the theorem is, is kind of ba backwards uh, reasoning. Uh, this is a kind of a perspective, categorical perspective on, on these results. Um, but but it, it explains those results. So th this results. But, but can you reprove the results this way? Because you seem to construct some R matrix, which <coughs> obviously will be a quantization of something. Yes, but, but then you'll have to show that that R matrix is actually the Baxter Belovin one. You have to, at some point, you have to prove triple common type results, and I, I'm not proving those type results. Well, it's more or less unique, so it's. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So, so there's some computation. But in principle, it gives you some. You construct some elliptic R matrix. That's right. For which the state degree is equivalent to Young. Yeah. There's some argument that needs to go into that argument, uh, into that uh, statement, or yes? Okay. Then, then it's kind of part of the question. So if you, the, when you did PJLN, right, the conjugate spiral uh, function? Yes. So do I understand that, that when you say that in other types you have to have a dynamical parameter, are you saying that you have you can add something that goes to the bun H? Yeah, we did, uh, did this uh, so oh, the, sorry, first, sorry. the first function is exactly okay. the same, okay. yeah, but you cannot take fiber, uh, fiber of, of the original bundle, okay. but you have to reverse it to find okay. And you have a kind of elliptic dependency on the bundle. Um, sorry, so the adjectives you wrote there um, amounts to a holomorphic topological twist of a Forty theory? Yes. Uh, maybe, yeah. Line operators? Yes. Um, uh, uh, let, let me just put two names. Um, so there, there was a paper by Costello uh, and Yamazaki. Uh, they have some comments on the dynamical case. Uh, the idea is that in the dynamical case, uh, the dynamical case is related to um, to DBF theory, so it's it's not going to be kind of interface into nothing, but it's going to be an interface into to DBF theory. And the quantization of, of, of that is related to the Hirsch number by contrast. Anything else? Then let's thank Paul again.